Oh, oh my goodness. I need to tighten up that bank. It may also be the case that I just need a new tripod. It's getting a little loose. My goodness. That'll do. So, good morning, everybody. Um, so, we are moving right along through the course. We don't have that much left to go. Let's take a look and see where we are. in the week 11 material sessions. This is a course which includes the winter break as a numbered week. So, some, yeah, some courses that I, we're on week 10, this course we're on week 11. But our topic of the day is going to be sessions. Um, hopefully this isn't too, too bad. Sessions are kind of, I'd say, a lighter conceptual topic. Um, comparison to some things that we've been talking about in this class. Next week we will be talking about user authentication, uh, i.e. we're going to be talking about login systems. How does a server verify someone's identity? What are the best, best practices, etc.? Finally, in week 13, we will talk about Laravel. Laravel is a framework. Basically, we're not going to get too heavily into it, but you may notice as we're going through these examples that especially with the server side stuff, uh, not so much with like front-end design, how you set up the HTML, everybody's web page should look different, right? But the way that server stuff is done, there are certainly a set of best practices that you should be following in order to ensure security. And there are a number of common design patterns. You know, login systems should work more or less the same no matter who's making them or where. So, in recent years, the common thing to do is to collect up um, the sort of basic operations and package them up as what they call frameworks. A uh, framework on the server side is conceptually not too, dif not too distant from something like Bootstrap on the on the client side. What you have are uh, what you have are a number of essentially library functions and code that has been written for you for your use, which you can download, use, install, configure, um, instead of having to write everything by hand from scratch. Um, <clears throat> the reason we don't start you off with frameworks, um, this is fundamentally still a class, right? The purpose of this class is for you to understand how things are working under the hood. If we immediately jump to, you know, that kind of high-level interface, you miss a lot of important knowledge about, you know, how do cookies work, how do sessions work, how do login systems actually work, because you have to know how these things work in order to diagnose problems. Make sense? Good. So, let's talk sessions. So, we've talked about um, we've talked about a lot of things on the PHP side. I know it kind of seems like after the first half of the course, it's a course on PHP, which you know that's kind of fair. Um, but 
with sessions, we're getting back into um, talking about how the, uh, the client and the server communicate, rather than just sort of more strictly being in server land all the time. So, what is a session? Does anybody have any idea? Yes. To the server? A way of identifying the client to the server? Yes. Um, certainly. Because of the precise manner in which the client-server interaction happens, the, uh, this type of verification has certain um, restrictions, limitations, but a great deal can be done with sessions. For example, um, login sessions are sessions, right? So, let us consider, for the moment, our HTTP header. This is, uh, I imagine you probably talked about this in your networking class. So, HTTP headers are included with HTTP requests and responses. Again, here as elsewhere, anytime it says HTTP, just silently insert the S on the end. You know, these are supposed to be HTTPS headers, but, you know, people still commonly just refer to it as HTTP. HTTP headers typically contain information about the request itself. So, how big is this packet? Was this sent using POST or GET? Um, what is the type, uh, when you're talking about response packets, um, the type, data type, or file type of the response is included in the header? Like, for example, um, have you guys heard of MIME type? M-I-M-E type. It makes a nice little segue. So, <clears throat> MIME types are like, they're like file extensions for the internet. So, for example, we may have image types, which might be JPEG or PNG or you know, SVG plus XML or any of these different uh, image formats. There is a string which is included in the header that tells the, um, tells the client what has been sent back from the server. You can configure and set this Inside of a uh, inside of an H, uh, inside of a PHP script as well. So, for example, for an additional example, text, plain text, text CSV, text HTML. Text HTML is going to be what you get when you uh, initially load a page and you requested a .html file, right? So, mime type is something. Uh, that is also sent back uh, back to the client from the server, depending on what resource the client requested to be loaded. Mime type also figures in when, for example, you're uploading an image. When you upload an image to the server, it is useful to tell the server what the file format of the image is. Otherwise, Image does, or the server does not know what the correct file extension is for that image. It's just binary data. <clears throat> so, user agent strings are an important request header that tells the server about your machine. For example, what operating system is being run, what browser is being used, all of this type of data. If we um, take a look here, can I zoom this in, please? Okay, let's do it yourself. All right. So, 
gives you the information on, from the response header first, but, and you can see that um, content type is the mind type right here. Um, in this particular one, we are requesting the sidebar image for this website. But if we take a look at the information there, why weren't you working before? My goodness. Maybe the mouse is going or something. Inside of the request header, you'll notice a lot of information, some of which we know about, some of which we don't. Path is, of course, the path to the image that was requested. Method, we're getting it by get, you know, so far so good. Um, here's some interesting thing. Here's some interesting things though, right? Origin. What is the origin of the request? So developer.mozilla.org is the um, it's the domain from which the request came, right? So, for example, if any of these are external links, um, let's see, this one, for example, that although this is IANA.org, the referrer is given as developer.mozilla.org. So um, one of the things that the request header contains is what website were you on before you were on this one? Um, and the only right way to break that really is to um, access it through the address bar, which and a, an address bar request sort of discounts a lot of this metadata. Um, and you can see that some of this includes things like what browser am I using, Chromium, what version of my browser am I using, right? What is the operating system I'm using, right? All of this, and is this a cross-site request? Yes, it was all of these things, right? All of, this in, all of this information is being sent to the server. Are you, are you folks familiar with uh, Google Analytics? Have you tried to use it at any, at any point? Well, you will find that what Google Analytics and other analytics sites are basically doing is tabulating this data. Um, Google Analytics will tell you some very interesting things, like from what website are people being referred to your website from, right? Most often, uh, what or set of websites. Um, obviously, when your website is being accessed is stuff that appears in Google Analytics. Um, what you can even see like a uh, pie chart of what operating system people are using to access your website. Um, if, incidentally, you see a lot of stuff that says like something strange here, it's not like the big three, you're probably looking at bots. You know, you can estimate how much bot traffic you have by whether or not the operating system was listed. But you can also get interesting information from the routing data, uh, which is not given here like what part of the world did this packet originate in, right? You can tell that by, um, you know, arcane things to do with the addressing, which I'm not sure about because I'm just a humble software engineer. So that's what Google, that's what Google Analytics and similar analytics packages are actually tabulating, is the information in here. So, HTTP and HTTPS are quote unquote stateless interactions. That is to say, 
when a server receives an HTTP packet, there is nothing native in the request header or anything like that which carries um, which carries uh, like variables or any program data, right? When a packet is received by the server, the server has no idea from whom it came. It could have come from anybody, right? Does this make sense? Because this is a fairly important point. Um, so, here, I'll, I'll, I'll do it on the board. So, HTTPS is stateless, right? Imagine you have your server, right? And let's say we have, oh man, let's say we have with several, or one server with several clients, right? I want you to imagine a little port on your server which is receiving incoming packets, right? If one sends a packet, it goes flunk into the tunnel. Right? If two sends a packet, it goes clunk into the tunnel. If three returns a packet, it goes into the tunnel. The server only has the information that has been sent in the packet. Right? Um, if you'll take a look at your standard packet, Set. You'll see that, um, like, a, like this. This information is. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's off. Um, the information which the client is sending is not sufficient to distinguish it from other clients, right? So, for example, we have remote address, right, which is one of the fields in an HTTP header and under the general category. So, address is the IP address of the server, right? So, the server cannot know where a packet originates, right? That information is not sent, and for good reason. Um, well, at least at the time they believed it to be a good reason. <clears throat> when the people who were constructing the original internet architectures were putting things together, one of the things that they 
designed the internet for was anonymity. Right? You've probably heard this before, right? So the um, the client sends a fair amount of data about itself, but the intention of this data is primarily where is um, like what is some here is some information you might need to configure my page for me, right? So. As far as the server is concerned, when it receives when it receives a packet, it processes that pack that packet agnostically as to where it came from. Right? This also allows it to handle uh, packets asynchronously. Right? It can deal with them as received. It doesn't, you know. So, another way of putting it, let's, let's imagine that we're requesting a website, right? Like an HTML site. Index.html. Let's say that this page loads a resource, styles.css, right? When the server receives a request for index.html, it says, okay, here's index.html, it sends it out, and if it never receives the request for styles.css, it doesn't, it doesn't care, right? Um, when it sends index.html out to, you know, number two, for example, its job is done. It's like, that's the request, I have served the request, that is all that I care about, I'm going to go back to sleep now. It is only when 2 receives index.html, sees that this styles CSS file has, uh, is requested, that it constructs a second packet to request styles.css, which wakes the server back up again. It's like, oh, somebody is requesting my styles.css document. Here you go. And then it goes back to, back to sleep again. Here you go. It's not keeping track that the client is loading all of the CSS files contained in the HTML doc. That's not something it's keeping track of, right? It doesn't care, right? As far as the server is concerned, if this thing crashes, if the client crashes in the middle of loading the HTML file, and or possibly while that packet's being served, right? If this thing is undelivered somehow, right? The server is under no obligation to, for, to follow up on it, right? or if the computer dies, or whatever. If it never receives that additional request for styles.css, then the server has no way of knowing that such a thing would have been necessary to like perform the correct operation of, of the website in the first place. Um, this is a kind of a long and complicated way of me coming back around to a point that I always love making with students, which is that computers really don't know anything, right? They're not reading their own files. They're not like deciding what should, what's, you know, uh, you know, there's no common sense when it comes to a computer. It only does as it's instructed, right? For humans, it would be common sense, you know, Oh well, if I'm loading this web page, then I should send along all of the resources necessary to load that web page. Why wouldn't I do that? That makes sense. Um, but the computer doesn't think that way, right? It's only like it. It only thinks I have had a resource requested. I send that resource, and that's my job done, right? Um, 
And this is why every once in a while when you load a web page, you get like this weird like white version with all of the text lined up vertically. It's because the CSS file failed to load. But anyway, so HTTP is stateless, right? It doesn't remember anything between transactions. The HTTP protocol, that is. What sessions do is they give us a way around the inherent limitation, this inherent limitation of the HTTP protocol. So, because being able to recognize a user between different requests happens to be a useful thing to be able to do, right? Um, if, it, like, if that was all you had for the internet, basically the internet itself could be little more than an archive for information, right? Some people put information up, other people retrieve that information, there's no dynamic element, um, and everything has to be openly available and free, right? Which, honestly, is probably a bit closer to the original design intention of the internet in the first place. It's like that plus email, right? That's like the original internet. So, for example, a shopping cart on an e-commerce website, you know, as you are scrolling through Amazon, you're having to click links, you're having to load resources, um, you're definitely not doing the whole thing via Ajax calls. We need to state, uh, we need states to give users a sense of being logged into an application. Um, do you folks know what I mean by the word state? I'm not talking about the states. I'm talking about program state. We need memory. We need some form of memory dedicated to a particular user. So, for example, you can only view your news feed when you're logged into Facebook. Or, to give a medical example, um, um, if you have, say, an application where, a, um, like, digital health charts that a nurse is, like, has on a, a, on a tablet or something, and she's flipping through digital, uh, digital charts, right? Um, if this is being served by HTTP requests, which probably it would be, right? Um, how do you constrain the uh, patients? Like, like, the nurse would be assigned patients who are in a particular ward, right? It's not useful for that nurse to see all of the patients in the whole hospital, or even worse still, for example, all of Hamilton Health Sciences operated facilities, right? You want to filter those results for the those that apply to her specifically. Now we know that that's a database operation, right? But um, we also need to like perform one validation step at least to make sure that this is the nurse that we say, like the nurse nurse is who she says she is, right? Um, you know, two-step authentication or whatever. But if you had to re-authenticate every time you load, reloaded the page, <laughs> like that wouldn't be a good use of time. Like nurses are extremely busy people. And that would just cause, like, what would end, what what would end up happening is they'd go back to paper, right? Because in order to be adopted, the technology has to be an improvement over the old technology, right? So, the, so the problem of being stateless in HTTP interactions is ultimately solved by the concept of the cookie, which we talked about briefly last week. A cookie 
is a small piece of data sent from a web server and stored on the client's computer. Web browsers store, uh, manage the storage of cookies, so if you hop between um, Chrome and Firefox and Opera and Brave and all of these web browsers, each one is managing their cookies separately. This is why a login session that you log, like if you log into a website in Chrome, you do not, res you do not still have that login session in Edge, right? As far as the server is concerned, those are two different computers, you know? So, the client sends cookies on all future requests to the, uh, to the web server. Cookies are sent back and forth using HTTP headers. So the cookies are information that gets placed in the header. Cookies, <coughs> Like, <laughs> I was about to say the flavor of cookies, but the cookies taste a lot like get parameters at the end of the day. Um, cookie names are your keys. Cookie values are strings that get sent along with the rest of everything. <clears throat> so, let us now take a look at some wild cookies. We can take a look at cookies that actually exist. I'm looking at my canvas, of course. I'm using Chrome. There's a slightly different way to look this up, depending on what browser you're using. Um, but usually it's somewhere in this vicinity. If you take a look at um, application, yes, here we are the application tab inside of your Chrome inspector pane, you'll notice cookies is a thing that you can take a look at. Cookies. So we've got cookies grouped by domain. So we've got mycanvas.mohawkcollege.ca, which is our particular domain of the learning management system that like the college has paid for, that's our URL, that's our server. But you'll notice there are a certain number of cookies for sso.canvaslms.com. That is the vendor of this software, right? A certain amount of JavaScript, probably, or other resources were not given to us when we created the My Canvas server, right? A certain amount of that information is still being referred back to the vendor, which, you know, if one is the, uh... Hello! Welcome back! Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I was coming from by bus. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I had no idea how long it's going to take. Well, it's, it's just good that you're here. Thank you. And I'm glad that I see you guys again. Yes. Oh. We, we missed you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I really appreciate your help for extending the assignment for me and, and uploading all these videos. And yeah. It's, it's great. Thank you. I, uh, I, I hope that the quality wasn't too much of that. Uh, I was having a difficulty, but it's, yeah. it's like I'm still... Okay, one thing that you do get through this method is uh, automatic captions. So, yeah, that's uh, what I, I'm going to do, yeah. Yeah, that's like um, no other method that I, like, it's like I don't have time to manually caption these, right? So, so yes. like the Google generated captions are about as much as yes. I can produce, so. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. You have that option too, so I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So, oh, uh, we were just talking about cookies. Okay. All right. Internet cookies. Not real cookies. Um, so, if you take a look at your cookies, for example, from Canvas, you'll see that they have a number of different names and a number of different values. 
there's a, not, there is a certain amount of information in these things, of course. Um, another thing is that you can take a look at, like domain is in there, path, and that's not meaningful. All of these are session cookies, right? Um, HTTP only. Wow, this one really should be HTTP only. I'm surprised. That's a security vulnerability, actually. But, um, and we'll explain why. <laughs> um, that means that this, uh, this token can be accessed from JavaScript, which means that that token can be stolen by malicious JavaScript, which is probably not something you want. But anyway, you'll notice that how these things show up is key value pairs, just like get requests, just like post requests, and just like um, objects in JavaScript, and just like associated arrays in PHP. Key value. Now, you'll notice that all of these keys are random scrambled garbage nonsense, right? These are actually cryptographic keys. So this is cryptographically secure information. So it's very important to properly understand what a cookie is and who has access to it. Right? Cookie values are client viewable information, right? So, and you know, we're not talking about your regular run-of-the-mill, um, you know, end user who doesn't know what the inspector pane even is. We are talking about other software developers and, of course, malicious software developers. You saw how easy it was for me to get into this data. Right? Um, a hacker can get into it just as easily. So, you store information here, right? You don't have to store random characters. You can store anything, anything you can encode as a string. If you want, you can JSON encode a, uh, you know, a data structure, structure, that a data structure from the server, send it in, right? Um, if you want, you can just put a random string in. Sometimes these things contain options that you want to set um, for the JavaScript, you know? If you, want to, if you want to configure the thing as having dark mode enabled or something like that, that's like a typical thing. These can just be strings. These are also modifiable. It's just this easy. There we go. Now, when I send, when I make an additional page request to Canvas, my login session will say hello world instead of um, you know, being that secure key. That's the, that cryptographic information. So, let's see what happens. Oh, it just reset itself. There we go. No, it's reset. That keeps every time I click off. Probably a thing for it. Secure. Ah. There we go. Disable security. Now try it. There you go. So you see, <laughs> all you have to do is uncheck the secure button. So that's it. That's it. Yeah, these things aren't secure, right? Um, all the security check button does in this case is. Um, prevent someone from modifying it accidentally, right? So now, 
I'm going to send a bad request to Canvas. Let's see how it deals with it. It seems to have sent me more cookies. Okay. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. There we go. So, I believe what's going on is like the, um, there's like a Mohawk College login which is overriding things at the moment. Or I'm not blowing out this, this cookie as well. Oh, oh, here we go, actually. No, this is entirely for different purposes. So, if we take a look at the, um, the information being sent to Canvas LMS, who again is the provider of this software, this is a good example of a cookie whose contents are not random garbage. You can see that last known Canvas host has been sent as mycanvas.mohawkcollege.ca, right? So that's just plain text information in the value, right? So that's what a cookie is on the client side. Again, it's very important to realize that cookies can be modified by malicious people, right? So if you're setting up a, a login system, you can't just say, oh, this is logged in user number one, number two, number three, number four. You can't just hand out like cookies with the natural numbers on them, right? Because that way, anybody who you care to mention could pretend to be any other person by just picking one of those valid numbers, right? Like, you know, say we were using cookie values 1 through 10, right? All that, a, all that someone would have to do is load the page several times, notice that they're just getting, you know, 2, 7, 3, 7, 2, 2, 9, that they're just getting numbers less than 10. And then, in order to behave like they're anybody else logged in, all they have to do is say, okay, I'm going to see what user number 5 is doing. Modify their cookie value to 5, and suddenly they're logged in as whoever, el whoever else was logged in as user number 5. Because again, HTTP is stateless. It doesn't know who number 5 is. The only way it has to identify them is by the value of the cookie that's being sent. Right? It doesn't match them up with IP addresses or anything. So, um, which part? Sure. So, if we imagine a scenario where, um, so the scenario we're talking about is like validating a login, right? We, when the client includes, so cookies, right, these things are sent automatically by the client to the server anytime a request is sent. So if the server was issuing just regular numbers between 1 and 10 to all of its logged in people, right, all anybody would have to do to pretend to be somebody else would be to pick a number other than the one that the server gave them. The server can't tell the difference, right? So if you have, like, my cookie, right? The server issues you a value of 7. You go into this tab, modify it to be, yeah, 5 or, yeah. If you go in, say, I'm number 5 now, um, then you are number 5, right? You have access to all of number five's information. You are logged in as number five. These are session cookies, right? Which is a fairly substantial data breach. 
all right? And pretty easy to get to. So, what you have to do is you have to make your ID string unguessable. Right? So this is guessable. If you make your ID string, for example, something like this. I believe this is in hexadecimal. But let's see how many characters we have here. Thirty-two, or yes, thirty-two, which makes sense. So thirty-two hexadecimal digits, right? So you have sixteen to the power of thirty-two possibilities, right? Now this is already Google. 16 to the power of 32. This is the number of possible user IDs. 3.4 times 10 to the power of 38. Right? This is, as we call in the business, a large number. Right? So, this is the kind of number where, if you were guessing, say, one trillion guesses a second. Thousands, million, billion, trillion. That's how many seconds it would take you on average to find the, you know, to find a particular login, right? That's, uh, and that's seconds, that's minutes, that's hours, that's days, that's years. That's how many years it would take. Right? Now, obviously, this is looking for one other login, logged in person among all of the people who might be logged in. So, you know. Um, Maybe, let's say there are a billion users, or let's just say a billion. Nah, let's do a billion. Let's say there are one billion users logged in, which is like, actually that's 10 billion, which is more people than there are. Um, there we go. Three, what am I doing? Three, three million, no, it could be one billion. Even so, even if there are a billion people logged in to this particular service, that's how many years it would take on average to correctly guess one of their user IDs, and you don't know which one. And it's only good for 20 minutes because it's a session with you. At most 20 minutes, right? Um, let's see. I'm, so that's million, billion, 10 billion, 10.7 billion years, right? Mars then. Well, yeah, we will definitely have a Mars colony by the time you succeed, right? So that is, that's why cryptography works, right? Um, and that's why a cryptographically secure key is, you know, pretty good protection against people trying to guess what your, ID, what your cookie ID is. And if I may say so, the particular cookie that we looked at there was quite short, only 32 digits. If you consider one of these guys, which includes numbers, characters, and underscores, and other you know, dashes, special characters as well, Right? Um, the numbers just get increasingly huge. And it costs almost nothing to make an encryption key longer. Right? Um, so that's why you don't use plain numbers for your, 
for your keys. But <coughs> does that make sense? Good. So, so let's run through how cookies are sent, stored, and retrieved. server wishes to establish a session, it will do so by issuing a cookie. So, when the server sends its response, it includes index.html, and it also includes the cookie. Just for the sake of argument, let's say that the cookie is equal to the value. The value of the cookie is five, right? It's basically a session ID. <clears throat> um, cookies are a more general tool than just session IDs. That's what they're mostly used for these days, but they actually can contain general string information. Um, so what happens is index.html gets rendered, happy face. The cookie gets stored in the client's cookie jar along with all the other cookies. Right? Now, time passes. Right? The client makes another request to the same domain. Let's say this is, you know, my domain .ca, right? The client makes another request to my domain not, uh, .ca. Say, for example, request cute kitten .png. Right? Let's imagine that that file does exist. When the client makes the new request, it doesn't just send the request in the regular sense. Hanging off of that request, like the unwanted turd that it is, is a cookie. Cookies are always automatically sent by the client. Any cookie in the cookie jar which is matching the domain that the request is being made for is automatically forwarded. So it does not require any specific or particular action on the part of the client to send cookies. Make sense? I'm pretty sure there are ways you can configure an AJAX request so that it doesn't send cookies. But like the default is send, not uh, to not send. Right? Make sense? So <coughs> the client sends the response, uh, sends the request. The, the uh, server receives the cookie. It's like, oh, 
I just gave you five, like, three minutes ago. Hello, five. And then it's like, okay, five, I've got all of this information that I was, that I've been keeping on, on you to improve your user experience, and definitely not for nefarious means. Um, so, does that make sense? That's how cookies get sent. It's really not possible to understand sessions without understanding cookies. Question? Yeah, so the cookie is valid for how long? So, if it's just a regular cookie, you get to set the expiry. Okay. As a client, I have to set an expiry, or as a, as a... As a client, you can always go in and manually delete your cookies. Okay. Yeah, if you're going to do that, I don't re recommend doing it manually. I recommend using your browser's delete cookies function rather than like going in and deleting them all. Um, but um, when, when it comes to session cookies, um, session cookies are just cookies in the regular sense with certain defaults set um, by the session handling apparatus in PHP. Um, the default is 21 minutes. Um, but you can modify the default value to be shorter or longer as it needs to be modified. <coughs> so, ah, well, here's this thing that I uh, that I just did on the board, so I'm going to get it. So. Now imagine the server gives each client requesting the application a unique cookie. Every time the server gets a request, it should check for a cookie and then see if it was the one of one of the unique cookies that it had given a client. In this way, the server would be able to know which client is which and send back data associated with that client. That is to say, their shopping cart or their new speed or, you know, or what have you. So, the purpose of the session cookie is to uniquely identify a particular client in a way that's not guessable by attackers. Cookies are intended to be sent back only to the website that sent them, otherwise it's a security issue. <coughs> cookies cannot exceed four kilobytes in length, so cookies can't store image files, for instance unless they are very, very small images. We can see all of the cookies in our browser using tools like Chrome Dev Tools or the Inspector Pane. And JavaScript can also be used to see cookies, depending. Depending. So JavaScript can see cookies with a big asterisk hanging off of that. There is a field inside of the cookie. I over here, and get your act together, from HTTP only. If a cookie has been set as HTTP only, then JavaScript cannot access it directly. <clears throat> this is good because JavaScript uh, is the sort of thing that can steal a session ID and pass it to a hacker, right? This is the way that um, bad link address, uh, bad links and phishing emails often work. Um, the bad email link gets some malicious uh, JavaScript executed on executing on your machine. It then goes through your cookies looking for unsecured ones that it can access and passes those on to, you know, your hacker who then, by so doing, grabs your session. So, of course, again, with, with these, just like with the others, you can set or unset them manually. But you can't, this operation you can't do from JavaScript. The, modifying the cookie in this manner. You must actually be the client to uh, set or unset that checkbox. So in this sense, it's actually reasonably secure. So. 
In general, there are two types of cookies uh, that are used, session cookies and persistent cookies. Session cookies are meant to be temporary, only so long as the user is logged into your um, application. Let's take banking applications for example. Um, <clears throat> you remember how, um, or you know how you're logged into the bank and then you like leave your computer and you come back and you have to log in again? It's because the session cookie expired. It was meant to only be there for a certain amount of time, and then it's gone. And as far as the bank is concerned, you could be anybody. You have to re-authenticate. Um, <clears throat> um, so you know how um, banks, like bank logout pages, often encourage you to clear your cookies after you've logged out. You've seen these types of messages. Um, the reason is um, that they don't want that information lingering on your computer because, you know, in older, like, in older versions of the way things used to run, um, that would have sometimes still been a, a valid, like a valid login session that you could revive. Um, these days, people should be a little bit more like on top of clearing their sessions when people log out. So, in theory, this is perhaps unnecessary, but you should still probably clear your cookies. Especially if you're using a public computer. Oh, oh yes, especially so or using a, a computer on a public network as well. Persistent cookies um, are cookies that remain even after the browser closes. They typically come with an expiration date after which they can be deleted, but not always. Um, they can be used to prevent users from having to log back into a website again, or by advertisers to track users. So, um, You guys want to know how internet advertising works? Yes. Okay. This is kind of a fun one. So, before the advent of the cookie, it was kind of impossible to make real serious money on the internet. Um, so, yeah. We shall stare a bit into the abyss at the risk of having the abyss stare back into us. Um, so, what is the central object of internet advertising? What are, what, like, what are we trying to accomplish? If we have a site which um, uh, what do you want to call that? So, let's say we have the client. Let's say we have two advertising websites. These are websites on which ads have been placed. Then we have, I don't know what do you want to call it, like I'm just blanking on the term for it. The website which pays for the ads. A purchaser of ads? Ad purchaser? Let's go with that. So ad purchaser, right? So let's call this websites, right? So fundamentally, the problem that 
at, that uh, ad per the ad purchaser has. We want to pay advertisers who actually result in people visiting our website, right? We pay for clicks. You guys probably are familiar with that type of terminology. There we go. So, <coughs> basically, the person who is purchasing ads, um, it's not it's not very impressive for you to put an ad on your website, nobody ever looks at it, or no, and nobody ever clicks it because your website gets no traffic, right? That's not a high value product. And this guy is never going to pay for that because it's the internet. You could make 10 million websites that get zero traffic. And if you're, get, if you're getting, if you're charging if the purchaser is paying for a, an ad on each one of those websites, they're throwing money away, right? Because nobody's ever gonna, that, like, you, nobody's ever gonna click it, nobody's gonna visit your website. The whole point of advertising is to get people to visit your website, hopefully to purchase your product, whatever your product registered trademark is, right? So, you need some way of telling Which of these two websites sent this client? Right? You need to be able to tell where the client came from, which advertising website the client came from when they arrived at your website. Right? So, the client visits website A. Website A issues an ad ID. Let's say that in this case, this one issues X, 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 this one issues Y, Y, Y. Let's put another X and Y on there, right? So, that cookie gets stored on the client. Let's say that the client clicks a banner ad that takes them to, the, to this guy. Banner ads are just links, right? So this takes um, takes this guy here. Um, probably you would also get a user ID here. Just because you want to make sure that you're not like paying for a bunch of bots, right? So you get click, you get the click, the user. The client travels to the ad purchaser's website. The ad purchaser receives these cookies as well because they have been configured as cross-site cookies. Um, so when they're cross-site cookies, this is um, normally cookies are restricted to the domain that issued them. But for cross-site cookies, this is um, this is you know it's a particular way you can configure the cookie that allows the cookie to be viewed by uh, domains other than the one that issued it, right? So um, when the client arrives, they have the ad ID from website A and not website B. So the app purchaser knows that website A provided a single link, or like they have, they register one click for that website, right? And then at the end of the month, you know, however many clicks they've accumulated from that website, right? They send a check. Now, however many clicks they accumulated from this website, they send a check. Does that make sense? So that's how ad, uh, that's how internet um, that's how internet advertising works. Um, <coughs> incidentally, 
it's reasonably simple to foil internet advertising. Um, all you have to do is use a, a browser or a browser extension, which aggressively or even reasonably aggressively blocks cross-site cookies. Right? Um, it's tricky because a lot of these cookies are in fact issued by Google as, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Google and Facebook between them have basically an oligopoly on internet advertising. Um, when you search something on internet, it's like, you know, showing everywhere on Facebook and Google Yeah. Basically, Google and Facebook have collaborated to form a cartel that keeps anybody else who might be interested in forming an internet advertising service provider from entering the, um, the market, basically because um, they use anti-competitive business practice to, to do so. <clears throat> and it's actually technically uh, probably illegal what they're doing. I would say probably because I'm intending on uploading this video to YouTube. Um, obviously, the legality of their scummy advertising practice um, is would be subject to, you know, courts and stuff, but uh, let's just say, um, like, I think Facebook is like 20 or 30 percent of ads on the internet, and then Google is literally the rest. So, yeah, so that's how internet advertising works. And, um, you know, people who are inclined to try to make a case for advertising will say things like, oh, but without internet advertising, it wouldn't be possible for anybody to really make any money on the internet. And therefore, things like, you know, social media influencers wouldn't exist. And I say, good. I would prefer to live in a world that didn't have social media influencers, but that's okay. Yes. So they Yeah, and if you look at your uh, terms of service on TikTok, they literally just get to they just get to use you on it on billboards. That's in your terms of service. Um, it's yeah, like um, it's interesting. Yes. Um, if I may, if I may just say, for the record and once, social media is generally evil and you should avoid its use if at all possible. Um, like, when it's not being, like, just hyper-addictive, it's inflating narcissism. And that's, like, its only purposes. It's like, you literally take the worst of humanity and you put it in, you make it a website. You know? Terrible. You're not on Facebook, you're not on Instagram. Mm. That's good. We are good. Yeah. Do not have time to talk about this. <laughs> Me too. And I'll be damned if I let my children on it too. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, so. So sessions. So we've been eating around the cookie <laughs> for. Uh, for like an hour now. Let's talk about the session itself. So sessions are what, like, so we've talked quite a bit about like how the client thinks about cookies, how the cookies get sent back and forth, but we haven't talked about how things are handled on the back end. How does PHP and other, you know, things that use cookies, that's what how does PHP handle sessions? Like, what does this look like in terms of actual physical code, right? So, 
the session data is a super global. A super global in the same way that the get and post arrays are super globals. Um, the data contained in this super global is stored on the server and never leaves the server unless you are like intentionally kicking it out to the client or intentionally receiving data from the client and storing it there. <clears throat> so the session data is secure. It is trustworthy data. You do not have to filter things coming out of the session in the same way that you filter things coming out of the get, for example. Um, so, session. Incidentally, you also have access to cookies in PHP. Cookie. The cookie super global is how you access the values stored in cookies. So, hopefully you all remember how it was possible for me to modify the value of a cookie before I sent it. Right? If I can do it, a hacker can do it. So, <clears throat> cookie data is to be treated the same way that you treat get or post data. That is, you must filter it for scripting attacks. <coughs> Pardon me. You must filter it for scripting attacks the same way that you filter anything else originating in the client. What is our mantra? Who do we never trust? We never trust the client. Never trust the client. Never trust the client. Never trust the client. Cookies come from the client, therefore, do not trust them. The only time you should trust them is if they are cryptographically secure. Right? Because if they've been tampered with, Basically, they just won't work. They won't match your database, so you don't have to worry about tampering with cryptographically secure ID numbers for the reason that we went through, right? <coughs> the session data is never stored on the client. It's never kicked out to the client. The cookie ID lets us create a database entry for this user that is stored on the server it never leaves the server. The client never gets their sticky little fingers into it. So, the session data is secure. You do not need to <coughs> filter it first. Although, you know, if you're the kind of person who, you know, just filters everything anyways, then you are perhaps protecting against unknown types of future attack, who knows. It's better to have more security than less security, and even redundant security is better than, you know, not having redundant security, but, you know, you're also wasting processor cycles. So, so, Let's go through a couple of HTTP packets to see how this works in practice. Let's say that we are getting csu.mohawkcollege.ca. The response is sent back. Sends a cookie. PHP session ID is equal to that cryptographic string. On the next get inter uh, on the next get request that's sent out, the cookie. PHP session ID is equal to the same string that is sent automatically by the client. This guy then sees it, responds, everything is fine. Right? Without this cookie, the response to this packet would be the same as the response to that packet. Right? Without the session cookie, 
the server assumes that you are a new user who has just logged in. And if you're accessing something you're not supposed to have access to, the default behavior is to kick you out to the front page. It's like, oh, you're trying to access something that you haven't logged in. You need to be logged in to do that. So here's the login. Here's the login page. Right? So the way that you create the session is using the session start function. The session start function will do one of two things. If no session cookie has been sent, it will set a new one. It will establish a new session. If the client did send back a cookie, it receives the cookie, checks its database, and then pulls out any information associated with that client, storing it in the session super global. So although the function's name is start session, really its function, if you want to put it that way, is start or continue session. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so it really, like in my opinion, the function should be named session start or resume, right? So, the session super global is an array where any data specific to the session is stored. Uh, this data is known as session, like, session variables. Array contents are unique for each individual session. You then have a couple of utility methods um, for use in sessions. For example, session unset. Session unset destroys all contents of the session array, but does not destroy the session itself. Session destroy destroys all data associated with the session. Um, the cookie will still be sent back, but <coughs> pardon me. The, so unset resets the database entry to all oh, nothing, right? It, it, it destroys the data without destroying the session. Session destroy destroys the session itself. It deletes the, that entry in the database completely, which corresponds to that client. So what happens is if the next time that same client accesses it, it's going to be considered as a new person, right? So they will issue him a new session. Precisely. Yes. If session destroy happens, the client sends another request packet sending the old cookie. That old cookie no longer corresponds to an entry in the database, which means that as far as the server is concerned, this is like, this is an expired, I can't tell the difference if this is expired or this was intentionally done, so you are just going to be treated as a new person, we're going to make a new fresh session for you, everybody will be happy. The difference here is, this does not require the reissuing of the cookie. So the cookie is still there. Yeah. Now, um, you also have session ID, which returns the ID for the session, useful for debugging purposes. But um, there's another one, too, which is useful for security. Um, I think it's called session refresh. Regenerate ID. So, <clears throat> you remember me talking about like how stealing a session, like losing a session cookie, is a fairly big deal actually. Well, it's only good for as long as it's timeout, right? Reaccessing the same thing will um, like refresh the timeout on the cookie, right? It's not like you have 20 minutes from the initial point of login until you're completely timed out. Although, 
when I was uh, back, when I was doing my bachelor's degree at at McMaster University, I did it sufficiently long ago that like their course selection website was an in-house product, and it actually worked like that. You had like 30 minutes to select your courses, and, and then after that, your session was timed out, and you had to try again. And the reason that they did this was that their server was limited to by how many people could simultaneously access it. So like at the beginning, like during course selection, there was always this like huge crush of server traffic to try to get your courses selected. Because like the slots fill up, right? If you you could very well not get the courses you want if you if you dilly dally. So um, yeah, um, you know, many a uh, many a uh, afternoon of my early adulthood I spent sitting on that page refreshing every five minutes to see if I could get issued a you know a, a login token to the course website pick my courses pick the courses pick the courses pick the courses and then log out again um, and you know you had to pay your fees at that time too and um, well in my case it was always like you know all I had to do was like enter a bunch of required courses because like I was in engineering and we didn't get any electives. So, you know, um, for me it was simple, but for those poor like arts majors who have like 10 gazillion different electives, it's like, you know, do not expect to choose your courses at the same time as entering your courses, please. But uh, anyway, so this is like security measure, regenerating your ID. Um, Basically, if you keep one session ID for the entire time the user is logged in, um, you're a sitting duck, right? If somebody steals that session ID, that's like, that's it. The hacker and you yourself can be simultaneously logged into the same account, and you will be none the wiser. Regenerate ID refreshes your login ID. Now, it will al always only do this with one client, right? The regenerated ID cannot be sent to both logged in people because that's not how the internet works. Servers can only respond to requests. They can't forward information to a client. Not possible, right? So, if you regenerate, if you regenerate your ID every so often, right? Even like every time, let's say let's say you regenerate every time somebody logs or somebody accesses something, somebody sends a GET request. You have a fifty percent chance, right? You have a fifty percent chance of you being the person for whom the ID was regenerated, which locks out the hacker. It, it validates their session, and because they never had your login information to begin with. Right? Because they only stole your session ID, they're done. They can't be, they cannot access it any further. So that's so you got a 50% shot at just locking a hacker out if you regenerate your session ID. If the hacker regenerates your session ID, then you get kicked out. Right? If you get kicked out, what do you do? Not necessarily. Like as human behavior, if you get mis if you get kicked out of your website, what do you, and you were doing something, what do you do immediately? You log, back in. you log back in. Logging back in generates a new session ID, blows out the old one. Right? At least if the server is configured properly, it will. So then, in that case, because you have been forced to reauthenticate actually have the ability to do so because you are the actual, you know, you are the legitimate user and you have the login credentials, that also refreshes the ID and kicks the hacker out. Right? So this severely limits the amount of time that the hacker has to monkey around in your account. Does that make sense? So, 
Regenerate frequently. It costs you basically nothing to regenerate. All you have to do is remember to do it. So how can we do that? Oh, you just call the you just call this function okay. session regenerate ID. That's it. This is an optional. Uh, this is you can optionally also delete the old session. But if you delete the old session, then you're removing the old session data, which you want to. There's a reason that's default false, right? So yeah, you just literally say regenerate ID, empty braces, and that refreshes your session and helps. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, good. The actual session data itself is stored on disk by PHP in between requests, typically in a temp folder. Secure, um, so if you're sharing hosting, so, you know, if multiple people are using your web server, right, then if the web server is not sufficiently restricted, then that could be a security vulnerability, but, you know, mostly these are solved problems. Fun and interesting fact, it's possible to implement sessions without cookies. If you send, um, if you, you can basically send the same information via get request or post request. You don't necessarily, I would definitely recommend post request on this one. Don't send a uh, session ID number by get request, please. Um, like this, don't do this. But, um, <clears throat> Basically, the information itself doesn't, like, it's not necessarily, um, it doesn't need to be transmitted by cookie. Cookies are just a, um, a useful way of doing it. Um, a trend, like a kind of a, a way of doing it that people don't have to think about, and you don't have to really put any effort into continuity on the client side. The disadvantage of <coughs> pardon me, thank you. The disadvantage of using get or post parameters to uh, accomplish the same thing is basically that your client, like your JavaScript code then is required to manage your session ID number directly and like pass it through and put it in the right links and that sort of thing. And that's just a pain, and you don't want to have to do that. Just use cookies. Cookies are better. Just use cookies. <laughs> so, shall we move to practical demonstrations? Okay. So, um, I think for this one, um, for this one, I'm going to put the I'm going to do the example um, on CS Unix because that way you guys, you physically people in the room, and also our wonderful listeners listening from home, you can actually log into the website yourself and see how this behaves from a client perspective. I'll still post the code, obviously. So, um, we will need Putty for sure.
all of you will have CS Unix, Unix accounts, so you can follow with this as well if you want. There we go. Log in. You can see that this is the most amazing of all computer interfaces ever produced. A bash prompt. The most powerful symbol in all of computing. So, let's see here. Going to public underscore HTML. Go into, well, Winter 2024, make directory v11. I haven't used this as much as I thought I would during this class. cd v11. Um, piano. Um, I'm not doing it in BIM. So first, let's see how to set a cookie in the regular sense. Set a persistent cookie. I shall refer to the PHP documentation. Set cookie. Oh, no underscore. So, we are required to provide a name, next argument is the value, and then the rest of these are options which, you know, you can set or not, whatever, you know. For our purposes, we don't have to worry about them too much, but, you know, HTTP only and secure, these are default false in PHP, so if you want them secure, you have to set to true manually, okay? I'm not going to worry about it. So, set a cookie. Cookie name is my cookie. Cookie value is man who ordered the snow. I want to talk to the manager. Right? So, if you refresh the page, oh, and, oh yeah, I forgot to take out the underscore. There we go. Save, 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 save. Refresh. There we go. If we go to our application tab, cookies, CS Unix, there's my cookie. Man who ordered the snow, I want to talk to the manager. And you notice the characters have become like URL encoded rather than being like, like the spaces haven't come through the way you expect them to. Right? 
but that is definitely some version of what I sent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. so that's how you set a cookie. Right? Easy. Easy peasy. I'm now going to do an, a thing that you should never, 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 never do. Echo cookie. Oh, wait. Now you first have to check to see if it's out. So, when using cookies, there are, in general, two cases that you always have to handle. One is the case where the cookie is set, and the other is the case where the cookie is not set. The one where the cookie is set is, um, you know, this is a client who received the cookie and is now sending it back. Um, the cook one where the cookie is not set, this is either a new client who was never issued a cookie, or a client whose cookie expired, or a client who deleted their cookies, some situation like that. Any way, any, any, any way that slices, you treat them as a new client. Right? So. If cookie, my cookie, uh, is set, echo here. Else, echo oh. your cookie says and in PHP if you're going to do that you have to go into curly braces. So basically, is set checks to see if this particular cookie, my cookie, was included in the cookies that were sent by the client. And we're just differentiating. Um, oh, I've got it reversed actually. If not is set. So if the cookie is not set, send a cookie and tell the client, client you're giving them a cookie. Otherwise, echo the contents of that cookie like so. Don't use breaks. When you're using PHP, it's like break, 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 break. Um, so, so here is an interesting. Uh, here's the reason. Okay.
So, I have made the value of my cookie a script element with an alert box that says, you've been hacked. Oh, seems to think that there might be a problem with that one. I wonder why. Okay, so it's being it's being blocked on the browser side. That's a shame. Um, that would have been so good. Chrome, you're too secure. Um, but yeah, because I was receiving that, right, and just directly echoing the content, if it had contained a script tag, it would have also been echoed, and that would have shown up. But ah. Chrome blocked my example. So sad. All right. Um, so, any questions about that? That's roughly speaking how cookies work. It doesn't really get much more complicated than that, aside from like adding expiries and that sort of thing. Cool. I can send you a, I can reissue you your uh, login credentials, that's not an issue. Thank you so much. Perhaps during the break, which we now <coughs> should take because it's at 11 a.m. Sound good? Cool. All right. Um, I hereby, by the power invested in me by Mohawk College, declare a 20 minute break. Um, please be back by 11.22. At which point we will do our lovely class example of PHP sessions. Sound good? There we go. So, the first thing to know about sessions and starting them, this is very, very important, otherwise it won't work. The session, the session start call must be the first thing in the PHP file. The reason that this is the case is that it sets header information, and the header has to come before the body. And for some reason, we're like bleeding that separation down into the PHP file itself. So we have to set the PHP session before we do anything else. Session start. So let's take a look and see what that does just that much. Right. So, got a lot of things. So, refreshing the page, you can see that we have both my cookie, which is the cookie that we were setting previously, and the HP session ID. Here we go. And you can see 
that the session ID is precisely that string of 32 characters, although in this case it's not restricted to hexadecimal. It is including the entire lowercase alphabet set, which increases, um, oh my gosh, what are there, 26 letters in the English alphabet? So that would be 36 to the power of 32, because we're adding the digits as well, 0 through 9. Um, 36 to the power of 32 is the number of possible IDs not there. So 36 um, to the power of 32. Very, very large, right? Um, it's like 11 orders of magnitude larger just by including those extra characters. But anyway, so that's our session ID. You can see that if I delete it, if I delete it, start is called the session super global essentially doesn't exist after it does exist so I'm going to set a value in the super global called reloads I'm going to check to see if it's set right if is set session reloads, then we want to increase the number of reloads by one. Session reloads plus plus. If the session, if the session variable if the session array does not contain the reloads variable, then we want to add that variable to it. Session reloads equals one. Right? We can't increase it by one if it doesn't exist. If we don't know like what the original value is, we don't know what the next value is. But once we've set it to one initially, then for the rest of the time, we can just modify reloads. Then, very simply, we have, or sorry, you have loaded the page session One time. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, delete the session cookie. Reload, and it's back to start with the new session ID. Does that make sense? So the session data, right? Right now, basically, 
Um, this is how it works, right? In my session database, I will have fu to well, p. That's quite the string of characters for a professor to say on camera. I hope nobody clips that for a meme compilation or something. Anyway, fu to p. I'm gonna, you know, leave off the rest. That looks up a session array containing reloads reloads gets 28 right when I regenerate the key or actually here's Here's an interesting idea. Okay, here we go. Let's copy the value of this key. Copy it. Here. All right? Now, let's delete it. We're back to one. So, we have established a new session ID. Um, let's just a couple of times. There we go. D line QB dot dot dot. There we go. Now points to reloads gets four. Right? This session was never destroyed. It's still in the database, waiting to be timed out. So, in theory, you can still access it. If you have the ID, edit value, put in my ID number from before. There we go. Reload the page. 29. There you go. Dr. Moore, what happens when the cookie expires? Is it still in the database? Or um, is it automatically deleted? So, or is it just kept in a repository forever? It's not kept in a repository forever. Um, both the data here and the cookie have been set with the same expiry time, right? So basically, this is this is how the timeline works, right? You have the start time, right? You then have, if we're talking about the default. 21 minutes, which both the client and this database and the server receive, right, as their timeouts. At that point, basically it still requires the client and the server to run their own cleanup routines, right? So the client might, like, Perhaps you closed the browser here and you reopened it like, you know, three days later, right? Open it back up again. At that point, the cookie is actually deleted, right? The cookie is deleted as soon as the browser runs its cleanup routine, which it has to be like running to do, right? But the server is always running. So what the server will do is it will have its cleanup routine 
running periodically, the same way that a garbage collector works in a programming language. So it will say, every so often, I'm running my cleanup routine. You actually have this amount of time that the session is lit live, rather than like it doesn't it doesn't set an interrupt or anything to delete the cookie, right? It just periodically goes through its own database and deletes any cookies that have expired, right? So you technically have whatever this overage is, which is at maximum the time delta between this, these programs being run, right? Technically, that's how much time you have. But uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Um, so having said that, if it's deleted from the server uh -huh. after three days, let's say, sure. and you go back into the website, and on your PC, it retransmits an old cookie from three days prior. Mm -hmm sends it to the, to the server. Does the server know, hey, I communicated with this client three days ago. This is my cookie. Or because it's been put in the garbage process, does it, does it know that that cookie being sent again is from that origin? This is the only way it has to know anything about the cookie. Yeah, the, yeah the session. The session. Once deleted from once it's deleted from this database, um, it's just a bogus number. Yeah. It has no way of knowing, oh, this is an old session that I want to reestablish, unless you have uh, consented to a persistent cookie. Right? You know how when you log into Mohawk, it's like, I would like uh, would you like to reduce the number of logins in the future? Well, what that means is they're setting up a secondary session cookie, essentially. Um, the purpose of which is to reestablish the real session cookie, and that's a persistent cookie. So um, persistent cookies have to be consented to under legislation. Um, I have a question, Professor. Maybe it's yes. not relevant to this, or maybe it's a secret question. No, no, no. no so sometimes, like, if I go to the website, Persistent cookie. So this is a persistent cookie. So yep. It's basically the database kept there for. So you can check it with cookie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like you know, basically, okay, that's because of the persistent cookie. It's not about like you know, it, that that thing does not apply, right? Well, see, if you're if you're a business analyst analyzing this type of data. Um, that's a customer, like that's a known customer behavior phenomenon, right? It's like everything a person purchases through a website is a sale, and the goal is to maximize sales, right? By analyzing their internet traffic, they will see that people, like a, by including too much traffic, what they'll, what they'll find out is a user or you know some number of users will add an items to their cart on one day and come back to their cart up to X number of days later and complete the purchase, right? Um, it is wise, although it costs you server data, right? And like this costs money, to do, right? Um, although it costs you money to do this, um, there is a, there is a, um, there's like a, uh, you know, there's a point at which these curves intersect. The cost it takes to store these and the revenue you make from completing a sale that might not otherwise have been completed, right? Um, or maybe you put more items in your cart 
because you were shopping essentially for a longer period of time than you would have if you were required to do it all in one sitting. Yeah. Right? Got it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Another thing is, like, you know, because I did that, now wherever I go, especially on Facebook or YouTube, all these, like, you know, based on that cookie, I'm getting those advertisements. Like, you know, yep. selling me that product is sitting in your car, you have to buy it because how great that is. So yes. that's why, like, you know, they're, they're, these cookies, this is how it works. Right? So <laughs> what's happening there, yeah. right? Um, technically <laughs> speaking, all that's stored on your computer is an identification number. Yeah. Um, Facebook or YouTube cannot get any useful information out of an identification number. What that means is that the Costco server is sharing your private information Today. with yeah with Facebook and YouTube. Yeah. Um, but that's it, why we are yeah. getting those ads because they share our session IDs with them technically. Well, they're not sharing the session ID. What is likely happening? is there is a companion script, like JavaScript or something, um, like Google Ad Services, which is also tracking the pages that you visit and storing it in a central advertiser database. Okay. That's like, Costco does not necessarily need to share, like open up their server to Facebook to share it. It's more efficient for Facebook and just keep track of it themselves, right? That's like, they control their servers so they can run things efficiently on their end to do that. They're not relying on the client for, or they're not relying on their advertising partner, however you want to put it, and their hardware, which is probably a mistake, right? Um, so yeah, um, but there is there are absolutely um, websites, probably not Costco, but there are absolutely websites that, like, they track your data for the purposes of selling it, right? But the fact that the fact that you see these ads, who do you think put them there? Probably Costco to try to nudge you back into completing your order, right? Because again, they're all about maximizing their sales, right? So yeah, um, so yeah, they don't have to necessarily like cost code does not need to give Google or Facebook your login session and your login information for this to happen. Um, but yeah, this stuff can get quite insidious. Um, I remember um, my wife uses Facebook, um, unfortunately. Um, no, she never posts anything. She just reads stuff on Facebook. She's okay. Which is, <laughs> you know. She's okay. Yeah. Um, but all this information is not real sometimes. Like, yes. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. But she she does she she has Facebook I think under the excuse of like news or something. Uh, same thing with. But, um, you know, and to be fair, sometimes, like, the police get in contact with the public through Twitter slash X, so it is good to have a person in the household who is willing to endure it. But, um, anyway, it was kind of funny because, like, somehow Facebook was aware of when we got married because about eight or nine months after we got married, she started seeing all of these ads for divorce lawyers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's like, wow. Because you know, that's, like, that's Statistically, some, that's yeah, some, some bean counter somewhere is like, okay, so if we have, if we have marriage, and we have the divorce curve, then about the peak of the divorce curve occurs eight to nine months after marriage, so this is our advertising zone, friends. 
And of course, it's completely evil. But you know, what, do you, what else do you expect from advertisers? You know. But yeah. So. But you know what the worst part is? Advertising works. You know, there's a reason that they put money into it. It's because it's, it's, it's too much money. So that's the scary part. It's like, think about how much money they spend on advertising. Mm -hmm. Now think about how much more money they're making because of their, the money they're spending on advertising, right? Um, because if they don't, if they're not making money on the ads, they don't buy the ads, right? The businesses are not charities. So, yes, we live. So when when people say, oh, you know, there are jobs in big data and that type of thing. Um, that's what they're talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. And like Facebook in particular is a fantastic um, avenue for particularly that type of advertising because what do you post to Facebook? Major life events, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. When you get married, it's in Facebook. When you have a child, it's in Facebook. You get divorced, it's in Facebook. When your relationship status changes, Facebook knows. Right? I can't for the life of me understand why it is that people give all of this information away. Because it's, you know, it's being used. All of this information is like, fundamentally, I think it's narcissism. And that narcissism is particularly prevalent in our culture for whatever reason. Perhaps it's because it's like a it's a human thing. But like basically what's happened is through like the dopamine feedback of look at me, look at me, look at me, right? This narcissism has gone out into the internet and has been forged into chains and cages to trap people in. And that's how it comes back to us. It's Control you, right? So if you have, if you give somebody too much information, that person can easily manipulate you and control you. It's the same thing is going on with Facebook, right? Oh yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, except they're doing it, you know, on large statistical averages. Yeah. Of course, you know, fortunately, no, there's no such thing as the average human being, right? So. We have that at least, but you know, for how much longer is the question, I suppose. Um, but anyway, so what were we talking about? sessions, yes, 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 yes. So does that make sense with the with the reload example? It really. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. Sessions are kind of easy, <laughs> or they've been made easy. There's a lot going on in the back end, but from a sort of from your perspective as the developer, they run pretty well, pretty much automatically, and you like a lot of thought and effort has been put into maintaining. The a simple interface for you guys to use and for me to use and for everyone to use. Um, so, you guys want to copy that one down? See, see, if you, see if you can get it working. I think we can. I think we can take a minute or two of class time to do that.
are going to receive a session back. That's good. to a different Thanks. 
Supposed to be a tilde character. That guy next oh. needs to be followed by SA because that is your that is your username. Slash B. Interesting. Um, are you getting access tonight? When you try to access, when you try to access, no. That was working for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. working. Yeah, it's working. Oh. Yeah, most of your perk commissions are locked out. Yes. That would give it. Um, let me see here. I'm going to use some Linux. session start should always, always, always go at the top. In like a real HTML file, because like I made this in Nano, and I didn't include all the header that's supposed to be in there, normally all of the header would go here. And I don't want to have to echo all that. Right? That's just a pain in the butt. So the session, I mean the first part is usually before header. Yes. HTML. Yeah. Like, um, the first thing here should be doc type yes. equals HTML or whatever, however that goes. Something like that. And then you get the rest of your HTML. This should go for everything. Everything. But the, or 
also the second part is also in the header? No, this executes Spy. as you hit it. Oh. Right? So, um, yeah, you can mix PHP and HTML up like this. Right? Basically, the server runs through the PHP file and executes things as it finds them. Right? So, when it finds this initial PHP block, it executes it. Anything that's echoed is like inserted as HTML into the outgoing response packet. Then, I turn off PHP mode, and we're back in HTML mode for a few lines. This stuff also gets collected up and sent out in the response packet as HTML. Then, I turn PHP back on again, execute some PHP code, anything that's echoed, again, collected up and sent out in the response packet as HTML. So, yeah, um, PHP, you can, you can mix it up, you can do a little bit in HTML, a little bit in PHP. Um, you don't have to do the whole thing in PHP because, like, doing all of those lines and, like, echoing them all from PHP, like, why do that? You know? It's, it's ugly and it doesn't work very well. So, prone to error, that sort of thing. Oh, here's one for you. Let me show you a slightly better way of doing this. All right? Because that shouldn't go before the header, right? That should go in the body. You can literally just drop variables into HTML. This is um, this is the type of thing that we were doing when we were doing MVC architecture a couple of weeks ago, right? And just to prove this works. directly into HTML. Remember that the client never ever sees the PHP code. All of the PHP code is processed out before the HTML document is kicked off to the client. Make sense? I'm just going to do an example. You guys can upload it. Let's 
start the Apache uh, server. Uh, I suppose, why not? Session checkout and shopping.php. So let's check out, let's uh, let's take a look at each of these in VS Code. A less painful way to edit code. But I kind of feel like you don't really appreciate tools like VS Code unless you uh, Yes. Well, I mean, nano, of the command line tools, I think nano is the least painful. Um, you could be using Emacs. Weren't you using Vim for like batch scripting or something? No? We were using nano. You were using nano? Okay. Well, thank goodness that you weren't using Vim. You guys want to see Vim? No. <laughs> yeah. Too late. <laughs> this is Vim. At least it's got line numbers. It is colorful. But um, in order to actually edit anything, you have to press I to go into insert mode. And it's got all kinds of like crazy commands that you have to memorize to, like, you know how Nano has that nice little ribbon up along the bottom that tells you what the shortcuts are? Vim has a manual, and I'll leave it at that. There is, though, a, um, a cadre of Vim purists who believe that you cannot program in anything faster than you can in Vim. I'm not sure I agree. I'm a Linux guy, but I'm not a masochist. <laughs> so. so let's start with session.php, sessions demo. Check to see if PHP, if the session ID cookie is in request headers. If it is, and we know who the user is, load their session data. If it isn't, we don't know who the user is, create one and send it back. There we go. You can see that views is a piece of information that, you know, basically this is precisely the same thing that I did, but without curly braces. Right? Can you do it without curly braces? Only if this is only one line. Okay. So, in my example, You'll notice up here, yeah, you can do it without curly braces because each case only has one line. But here, for set cookie, I've got set, set cookie and an echo statement inside this block, so you are required in that instance to use curly braces. This is, otherwise, this is pretty much exactly the same thing, that same view counter. So let's take a look at shopping. So for shopping, we have a form, which basically lets us name our item and price, which, if this were uh, a real website, would be quite the feat to accomplish. It's like, order literally anything for any price. Do our best. But it's just two text fields. 
this is the assignment in your module? No, this is the example okay. code in, in the modules. So this thing sends posts, post requests to shopping.php. Again, right at the top. Oh, interesting. They've got the session start down here. Is it possible I was given old information about that? Interesting. Um, sometimes they update things so that little tricks you had to use to get things to work don't need to be done anymore. And it seems like the session ID might have been updated so that you can use it from anywhere now. I apologize for my old inaccurate information, which I received last fall. It was old when I received it. That's my excuse. Um, <laughs> so we start our session. Certainly, session start has to be used before you use the session super global. If request method is a post, we receive item and price by filtering our post inputs the same way that we've been doing so far. New item is item gets the value of item, price gets the value of price. If is set session cart, so if the session variable has a cart in it, um, then cart gets the new item added. Otherwise, we set the new, we have to set cart to, um, to empty and then add the new item to it. It seems to me that this is like PHP shorthand for append, which, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so what was your name setting of the cart? The session cart. You mean this line? No, the condition in the means. Ah, so it's very simple. Um, because cart session is always there in the shopping menu. So what, what is it set? But it's not always present in the session variable. So consider this. So when we click it, then it's set, right? Well, this one will, this web page will create it um, uh, basically once form data has been sent. But let's say you have the session variable, right? Initially empty. Initially empty, right? So, um, I can only say this with code. Um, is set um, uh, let's say just for sake, <laughs> sake of argument we have A gets one in there. Right? Is set session session at a yields true, whereas is set session B gets false. And it doesn't just apply to session variables. You can also have it as like post. Any any uh, associative array this works with, right? So basically, is set returns true if this is a key contained in this uh, data structure. I understand, but um, what does that mean? The uh, session has card and then the card is true. Is oh. clicking card or there are implied curly braces here. I mean, um, no, um, cart is a variable. No, cart is a key. Oh, it's a key. Yeah. So when is the set to what? Uh, when is the cart set to what? Um. By okay. Let's. Yeah. Let's let's run through it. Um. So. If you create a new session, the session variable is empty. 
Right? So, on our initial run, when we reach line 27, is set session cart? Is cart a key that appears in this empty data structure? So, cart is the one that I know in the shopping mall. In the shopping mall, there is a cart, right? Um, so, what we're talking about is the data structure that sits sits behind that, okay. the cart it's, icon. It's a shopping.php, means it's shopping mall use that PHP file, right? Um, now maybe we should just load the uh, load the page, um, local host, and I'll give you like this is a very very abbreviated view of what a shopping cart should be. Um, local host slash four dash three dash nineteen. There we go. So shopping. This is literally a, everything, right? So. Just enter a item and a price. So I want to say um, Snickers bar for ten cents. Submit, and you can see that what it's outputting here, which is quite useful, I didn't get to, is just. The, yeah, it's what's contained in the session variable. So, if you want, I can change that to Java encode, but, um, or sorry, JSON encode, but this is, this is called pretty printing, and it's like a nicer way of seeing it, you know? So, cart at zero is an array of item and price, stickers bar, and 10 cents. If I add another item, say um, prune juice, price $50. Prunes are expensive these days. You can see that. Zero is this and one is this. Oh, okay. Right? Yep. So every time you submit a new item, it gets added to the cart array. But, um, if I perform <laughs> just a little modification and have it print this no matter what, I'm just going to take rip this whole thing out. Basically, I've modified it so that this the session array will print now, regardless as to whether we clicked post or not. It's just in there now. I pulled it out of the if statement. If I reset my session. It's resending the form information because I, uh, when you hit refresh, it resends the form information that was sent. So here you go. Um, fresh session. I've got a new session ID. I've got my array containing nothing. Right? Because the array contains nothing, it executes this line of code, which is to say, uh, or sorry, this line, of, these lines of code. This is how you add a new item to an associative array in PHP. You simply assign something to it. We are assigning an empty array to it. And then this is PHP shorthand for adding a new item to an array, which, um, you know, another way you could have said this would be array push session card new item.
And then if I want to buy um, Smarties for five cents, there I have it. Now, what's interesting is if I now go to session, reload, 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 right? And now I come back to shopping. So, the session is not only being shared between different loads of the same PHP file, it is being shared between all of these different PHP files being accessed by the same server, right? You can maintain a session across multiple PHP files. Sound good? Look good? Everything? Etc. cetera? Um, now let's add a couple more items. Uh, any, anything you want me to pick up for you? Oranges. Oranges. Um, probably fresh fruits going up, so $60. Um, <laughs> uh, anything you want me to pick up for you? Juice. Juice. General. General. $3. $3. So then, anything you want me to pick up for you? Water. Hmm? Water. A bottle? Of, uh, of what? Oh, 15 cents. Did you know that a bottle of Coke was 15 cents for 70 years? 70? Yeah. 70 years? 70, yeah. Or it was 70. like from the invention of Coke in like the, the 1880s or whenever Coke was invented to the 1950s, Coke did not change in price. It was 15 cents for that entire time. So there we have it. We have some items. Now let's click. Let's take a look at the checkout. Um, the checkout page. It's quite simple. All it's doing is re-establishing the session and then creating an unordered list of all of the items in the in the cart. Just just printing it, right? Printing it, calculating a total. That's all this is doing. So, proceed to checkout. There's your checkout. Make sense? Excellent question. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so the question is, I'll repeat this for the for the camera. The question is, how is it that the session.php file connects to the shopping.php file with the with the uh, with the session? So let's break it down in terms of operations, right? So server and we've got session database right so let's say client requests session.php right this is the first request so a cookie is included in the response packet, and the database entry is made. 
So, session.php is retrieved. The server communicates with the database. Let's just pick, you know, just regular integer numbers for session IDs. Um, session ID is five, and views is one. Right? That gets stored into the server, and a cookie equaling five is sent back to the client along with, this is the request, along with the response, which is session.php. Though, of course, at this point, by the time it's being sent out by the server, there's no longer any PHP code in it. It's all strictly HTML. Right? So, okay, good. Client, time passes. Client now requests um, shopping.php. Included in that is the cookie with the ID number five, right? The session cookie. The server receives the session cookie and attempts to establish the session. It's like ID is equal to five. Look that up for me, please. It's like, okay, here you go. Data. Right? So, just because they're being sent, like just because the cookie is being included in requests for different files, um, you have to sort of, you have to understand that like, to the server, the, f the particular file which is being requested is just a piece of data in the packet. Right? It's not like sectioning itself off. It's not like, it's not doing a heck of a lot of processing with respect to like what the file is that I have requested. Right? It's just, you know, you could replace this with any file and it would serve that request. Right? What it cares about is the cookie. So there's a there's a separation of concerns between the particular resource being requested and the behavior of the cookie. Does that make sense? Mm, no. Um, okay. Well, my question is, the session key. How how the client how a client knows that the session which is number five, mm -hmm. is matched for that shopping. Oh, it doesn't. Um, it just takes this guy, stores it in its cookie jar, right? And then anytime it accesses this domain, which is like, you know, my domain dot C A, right? Anytime it accesses mydomain.ca, it just brings out anything in the cookie jar that matches that domain and it sends it off proactively. So no, the client doesn't know it's accessing a shopping cart. It doesn't know that it's it doesn't know what it's accessing over here. All it's doing is saying, I have these cookies, take them. Okay. Yeah. Good. So the server is a specific um, domain. So the session and shopping is only for the that server, right? Correct. Yeah. Like that might have been the missing piece. Yeah. This thing is part of the same physical machine, right? I'm 
but using the same kind of pictorial language that I use to discuss with database accesses, because it's like it's basically the same thing as a database access, but without SQL, kinda, you know. It's a form of database access, but you know, this is internal to the server. I'm exploding some of the details of the server. So the server, like if it wants to communicate with an SQL server, it can do that as well. That may or may not be running on the same machine. If it's like a small time operation, probably it's running on the same machine. If it's a larger operation, this is probably a dedicated server. Does that make sense? back too soon? No, actually, I'm um, still uh, exploring on for quite some time, and I'm still under the web, like the weather. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, um. <clears throat> no, I'm okay. Okay. I'm, 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 well, on the plus side, um, we've only got like, you know, 20 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes, really. Okay. Uh, professor, I yes. need your help with the, the midterm. Topics that you can find so I can basically review it before going to Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, we can, we can talk about that after class. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, did you have any uh, further points you'd like clarified about this interaction? I'm really happy you asked that you asked that question because, like, that's that's an important consideration, right? Why? So basically, in that example, is our domain like, you know, has all these different files associated with one set that session. Mm. Um, we are accessing that domain to that page, um, so it's basically connected with each other. So that's why, like, you know, we can access different PHP, shop.php, <coughs> and zen.php, and car. Yeah, it's not like a separate session database is kept for each file. That would be kind of ludicrous, <laughs> so right? Let's say the domain that CA is Amazon. That's CA. Yeah. And sure. That Amazon has only one you know, database system, and then if I have a cookie with a key number five, and then it search for the key, and then the value is returns. Yeah. Then I can search. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, this is probably not how Amazon works. Amazon is incredibly complicated. Um, but if we were to imagine something like what Amazon probably was before it became Amazon, right? Um, like Amazon is, you know that Amazon actually makes more money uh, by through Amazon Web Services than it does by being a store? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so Yes. So you have to you have to understand that like the client does not know anything about the server. The server does not know anything about the client. Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit this point many times, but computers are stupid. They don't know anything, right? There's no like the only knowledge which is, or information which is being transferred is the stuff that's being sent explicitly in the packets, right? So when this guy sends the second session, it collects up any cookies that might pertain to that server, right? And it sends them automatically. It doesn't know really what's involved in the operation it's requesting. It doesn't even really know what it's requesting. All it's doing is forwarding out the parameters that were established by JavaScript, which also has no idea what it's doing, right? Like, you know, so like fully, all right? You log into Amazon, you see an item, right? You see an item on the front page, and you're like, I would like that item. So you go to that item's page, right? And you click Add to Cart. What happens? Number one, 
information about the item that you are requesting get sent to some script through a request packet, right? Amazon starts a session with you by sending a cookie back in its response, right? The information about that item that you have placed in your cart gets put inside of your session database and hooked up to the ID that's issued to the client. If the client loses that cookie, the session is dead. Right? Yeah. How can a client lose that cookie? Three ways. Um, well, when a hacker, a hacker will usually copy the cookie, not delete it. Um, three ways that you can lose a session cookie. One, and most obviously, it expires. Right? When the cookie expires, the client just deletes it. Doesn't tell the server that it's doing so, right? It just goes ahead and deletes it. Which means that the next time this guy sends a request here, there's no cookie attached, which means I need to establish a cookie, but it's a new cookie. Right? So session timeout, that's one way to lose a cookie. Um, number two, someone was monkeying around with the cookie, right? Set it, like, modified the values in it somehow, you know, like I was doing. That will break the session as well. Right? Because then, if you send back a cookie with junk data, right? Like, you know, 878 or something. If that 878 does not correspond to an entry in the database, it says, well, this is junk data and can be ignored, so I'm just going to issue a new one. Right? So, if the SIP uh, if the cookie gets corrupted or something in transit, that can happen. Um, or if it was modified deliberately. So that's two. The other way is if the client just deletes it. Right? You know how, um, like, I've been going in uh, through the um, the inspector tab into like deleting cookies to reset sessions. You can do it that way, right? That's for debugging. Um, if you want to go through your browser and delete all your cookies, I don't recommend doing it that way, right? Well, like imagine visit, revisiting every website that you've ever visited and finding every cookie and deleting each one manually, right? Your browser has a utility to do this, to delete all cookies, so you should use that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. I was making a bit of a joke. Um, I appreciate that I have a rather obscure sense of humor, but I was making a joke. Um, so we're so. clearing all browser data, like cookies and everything. Like, is it a good idea to do it? Sure, why not? Um, actually, I'll tell you. Um, I'll tell you a story about why it's a good idea to do it. Well, not really a story. Um, so, permanent cookies, persistent cookies, right? In theory, you set a timeout on them, uh, but not everybody does. What happens to a cookie if you just never, if you, if it's never set to expire? It just sticks around forever. It stays there forever. So this used to be more of a concern like back in the day. But this also happens with certain types of like temporary files that your browser will download, right? So your computer is constantly picking up a certain number of cookies that are never going to delete themselves, right? So over time, your browser succumbs to an increasing case of diabetes and obesity because of all the cookies it's eating, all right? What the deleting all your cookies is, is it's a instant weight loss plan for your browser. It removes, it trims all the fat, gets you back down to your slim, like, you know, 
300 megabyte install size of whatever your browser was, right? And basically, it makes your computer not run much, much more quickly. Um, I remember in university there was this one, um, there was one, this one girl that I was going to school with who um, was having a horrible time with her laptop. It was just so slow. And these, this was back in the days when slow laptops were the expectation, not the exception. Um, and, I would, and she was like, oh man, I need to buy a new laptop because this one's so slow. And me being me, I was like, what? You would buy a new computer because the old one is slow? Have you tried to fix it yet? And she was like, I don't know what that even means. So I was like, give me, give, give me, give me. You poor thing, you poor thing. So what I do is I go through and I install a program, which uh, I think still exists, but it's probably filled with ads called C Cleaner. The C stands for crap. Um, that other utilities like this exist. And what it basically does is it just goes through and deletes all kinds of temporary files that are left there by various programs that are never deleted. You know, but they might be useful someday. Um, and at the time, um, this was a lot more than it is now, but at the time, uh, I scrubbed four and a half gigabytes of temporary files off, off of this, this poor lady's computer. And um, it was working much better after that. And after that, I gave it a defray, and then it was like it was a brand new computer. You know what disk defragmentation is? Yeah? I've heard of it. Did I discuss it in class already? We did in our uh, operating system class. Ah, okay. I guess. So um, I'll give you I'll give you the uh, the the Coles notes version because you know um, because I like it. Um, so what happens when you write a file to a to a hard disk, right? Let's just imagine this is our hard disk, right? You just sort of plunk a file in, in your hard disk, that's how you write it in. Let's say that as you're writing it in, you find another file is in your way. What do you do? You split the file into two chunks, right? And then you put a little link in there, and there, there's your file. Not, not a big problem, you can overcome that. The problem is, the more you do this, the more little pieces of file there are to get in the way of other pieces of file in your disk, right? So you end up with just this spaghetti mess of file pieces pointing to other file pieces. I have had files in the past that have been fragmented into over a thousand individual pieces, depending on the size of the file. It's got to be like up to like gigabytes in size. Yeah. So next you have to understand a little bit about our, how hard drives work. And this is more true in the era of spinner disks, but you know, nevertheless. Um, how a magnetic hard drive works efficiently is it reads blocks of data off of your hard drive. Right? They'll say, okay, I'm reading from here to here to get this information here that I need, which is somewhere in the middle. Right? So it reads in chunks. Right? Ideally, all of your files should be in this, all of the pieces of your file should be in the same chunk. If they're not, then, you know. Your magnetic drive, which is an actual physical disk, right, has to spin to the next, like, it has to modify its position to the next location to load in, like, the next chunk, like, down here, you have to load this chunk to, right? And it'll be fine, it'll, like, it'll do it. It'll load all of these chunks, one after the other, after the other, after the other, right? But, um, 
the more fragmented the disk is, the, the more chunks you have to load, the slower the system is overall to access its hard drive, which affects some things but not others. Like it doesn't affect programs running because that's RAM, that's a different memory system, but it will affect how long it takes your programs to load and like startup time and that type of thing, right? So defragmentation is exactly what it says on the box. You take all of these individual pieces of files, you stitch them back together, try to find continuous memory segments for them. All it is is taking chunks and like move them here, move them back, move these here, you know. It's just a bunch of like physical, like almost like unshuffling a deck of cards type thing, right? No, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so disk defragmentation is something that you should periodically do as well. Hmm? Not now, Oh, it depends on your operating system. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so it doesn't depend on the hardware. As there's no, it's not like you can go to the store and buy like a Linux hard drive, right? Um, what happens is your operating system decides what file format your disk uses, right? Um, <laughs> Windows operating systems use a particular hard drive format. Um, Linux uses a different one. Um, the answer is like in general, yes. Over time, like work goes into making the disk fragment less. So it's not nearly as bad as it used to be in the 90s. But um, keep in mind that like <clears throat> the, the Windows kernel, and these are like kernel operations, right? The Windows kernel is still, um, it kind of famously hasn't made that much progress since the Windows NT days. So, um, like, fundamentally, the window, like, these types of kernel operations, Windows is probably still a problem for this. <laughs> um, unless it, like, unless it has coroutines, which it automatically runs to defragment after it's messed things up. But um, in Linux, it kind of just has a, it just doesn't do this to begin with to a, to a, to a great extent. So, like it checks to see whether the hard disk has enough space for the file it's putting in before it puts it in. That type of thing, you know? But, um, yeah, it's, it's generally, um, if I'm recalling the, um, the general wisdom, you generally don't have to defrag Linux partitions or Linux operating systems. So, um, oh heck, that's class. Congratulations, everyone! It's twelve fifty-one. Oh yeah, everyone, it's the last class for the semester. Oh no, 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 no! <laughs> no we, we still got you for a bit, a bit left. Yeah. Awfully like, whoa! All right, um, all right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Um, Friday, we'll take these examples and we'll uh, play with them a bit, maybe add like a logout feature type thing, something to break the session, delete my cart, these types of functions. Sound good? changed recently. It's no longer pulse secure as some other one. I haven't installed it yet. I haven't needed to. Do you have it? If you go to my Mohawk or email IT, they'll be able to give you the give you the skinny. If you okay. So here are the rules, right? If you want to, if you want to access PuTTY or anything on CS Unix from home, you need to have installed the VPN and have it running on your own machine. 
So yes, installing the VPN is an action you must take in order to make it work. And uh, they also sent an email around recently that they dropped Pulse Secure and they're going with a different VPN provider recently. So um, you'll have that in your email. You probably got it, ignored it, or something. <laughs> All right.